In talking about his novel, The Surrendered, Chang Rainey says, it's not so much a war novel as it is a story concerned with the effects of mass conflict on the human psyche and spirit. The private odysseys, those who have endured conflict, must endure. The surrender moves from Korea in the 1950s to China in the 1930s to New York City and Italy in the 1980s. Not so much a tale of war, but the effects of war, the memory of war. At the start of the Korean War, Jun Han, an 11-year-old refugee, is traumatized by the nearness of war. One could even say the rumor of it. It says something that in the Bible, war and the rumor of war are given distinct, if not separate, identities that these are both very palpable contexts and both have its own type of devastating impact. And yet the memory of war, war and remembrance becomes crucial. A novel like this becomes a crucial and deserving choice for this prize because part of the process of peace, maybe the second part after the end of hostility, is to deal with the aftermath of war. And not just the physical, but the emotional, the emotional rift, guilt, heartache, detachment, emptiness, but also hope, strength, and endurance, endurance in particular. William Faulkner knew this in The Son and the Fury where the novel ends with a simple sentence, they endured, which if I were the Library of Congress and classifying Chang Rui's book, that's probably what I'd put on that page four or five, just put they endured. The novel ends, sorry, turns Rafferty in the New York Times says this, it's not an easy task for a novelist to make sheer doggedness beautiful, or even for the length of a story interesting. But Lee trusts his own patience, his stubborn resolve to get to the bottom of things. There is a moral gravity here, an absence of easy answers and easy redemption. And I'd add, in that, Lee pulls off the fantastic feat of the author, which is to surrender to his characters, so that they can either succumb to or pull themselves out of their own trajectories to try to weave something out of the fabric of their own fates, even if they fail. To examine what it means to be indomitable. Does it simply mean to endure? The novel does not provide the answer, but it renders the question with the most haunting and inescapable beauty. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of this year's Peace Pri sorry, Dayton Literary Peace Prize, Chang Reilly. You know, I think they're still looking for an Oscar host. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think they've settled on, on Billy Crystal. I think he's great. <laughs> uh, it's great to be here. Um, really inspiring to be with these uh, really brilliant writers. Um, and you know, there, there, there are, you know, many writers are brilliant. Um, but I think you felt tonight, just listening to these, to these folks, um, not all writers move you. Uh, not all writers um, do that essential work. And I think all the writers that you've heard from tonight do exactly that. So uh, I'm very humbled to be here. And I want to thank, um, I want to thank uh, everyone at the Literary Foundation, uh, Peace Prize Foundation, Sharon Robb particularly. We had some nice times in your class. And uh, I remember those students well. Um, and I also want to, of course, thank the judges. I, I've, I myself, I was just telling my table mate that um, I'm serving on a, a prize committee and I know how prize committees go. And over the last four months, I, um, I've been, I read I think 65 novels for this prize. Uh, and I'm, so uh, all the other things that I've been trying to do for class and it's just been crazy. So I know how, um, you know, it's, it's like trying to choose between lots of wonderful things, you know, really worthy things. And, Often it comes down to arbitrary moments, what you had at breakfast that day. Um, um, sometimes a toss up. And so I, I just, this is my long form way of saying I feel very, very thankful and, um, and very, very happy that, that I've, asked, I've been asked to be here tonight. Um, I also want to take the, this moment to acknowledge my wife, Michelle, and my daughters who are here with me. Uh,
it's, I, it's the first time they've, you know, you know I, I go off on book tour alone, I do my readings alone. It's the first time that I've had the whole family along, so it's a very special occasion for me. I, uh, um, I know you, you, felt, you folks know Richard Bausch, who won the, uh, uh, the prize uh, a few years ago, a couple of years ago. And, um, uh, he definitely he advised me that I should definitely bring along my family. Uh, he said, you know, you should do it. And, uh, you know, he said, you know, in, in that honey twang of his, you know, I said, uh, you know, should I really? He said, yeah, because it's a damn good party, you know, <laughs> in other ways, he said. So, he, so I, I know Richard if, if, I don't know, at some point, uh, well, I always send my love to him. Uh, he's a great man. Um, but anyway, uh, he said that, um, you know, I just wanted to re relate the, the, the story of how um, I found out, partly how I found out about it, is that um, I found out, of course, officially, uh, and then Richard called me. Uh, and he said, uh, he should, um, he said, well, okay, then bring your family because, you know, your, your kids will see your, your picture up there, and uh, they'll, you'll hear, they'll hear a lot of nice things about dad. And that at some really pivotal moment in their adolescence, they'll cut you a break. <laughs> so, uh, so that's what I'm hoping. Uh, so I booked their tickets right away. Uh, um, but in truth, I did want to share it with them because uh, um, I, I think they know that uh, I really couldn't write um, a word that mattered uh, without their love. So, thank you. Thank you to you girls. Uh, uh, as for words that matter, I think all of us here can agree that love and peace should always be on our daily short list. In the course of our busy and relatively very safe and secure lives, it's easy to forget the full meanings of such words. You'd think that I, having spent the better part of five years writing a story like The Surrendered, uh, would have trouble forgetting. But I know that I have and that I do. My family and I live in a nice college town with good schools and clean streets and a proud and progressive citizenry. And in the warmer months, we might even forget to close our front door, much less lock it. We are able to focus on our work and school assignments and creative projects. And we have means enough to plan and enjoy our leisure time together. We laugh much, much more than we cry. In these ways, we are blessed profoundly and deeply. And as I look at, out at them, um, I wouldn't want it any other way. Who would ever allow for such things as fear or hunger or pain to visit one's beloved? Of course, no one would if he could help it. We do everything we are able to ensure the well-being of our dear ones and maybe even willfully forget or ignore what can and does go on. For even just thinking about the deprivation and loss and suffering in our world, not to mention the constant misfortune and accident, can be a cause of serious anguish. And we don't want to be so frightened or saddened by the darker possibilities that we decide to stay inside all day behind gates or locks, either real or metaphysical. I think about my own father and how he could have easily shut himself away after what he witnessed during the first months of the Korean War. I wish to mention him tonight because it was the story of one of his experiences that was a catalyst for the writing of this book. My father is alive and well, turning 73 this year and enjoying his recent retirement from a physician's career. My family will tell you, as would everyone else who knows him, that he's one of the gentlest, kindless fellows you'll ever meet, a man who has a constant smile on his face and who has always been extra generous to and supportive of his family and his friends and his patients. He's no more perfect or better than anyone else, but he's a good soul through and through and endowed with a wondrous sense of optimism. Growing up with him, it's hard for me to believe that he could have seen the things he did when he was a boy in wartime. For he never once spoke of or acted in a way that revealed how awful those times were, or that he wasn't haunted. But of course, he was. I've written about this before, and so I'll very briefly recount it again. But what happened to him was something I learned only when I was in college, 
when I was taking a seminar on modern Korean history and decided that I would conduct an interview with my father to fulfill a writing assignment. I wasn't sure if he would agree. My father was 12 years old on the eve of the Korean War, and although over the years I had asked him a number of times about his experiences, his responses were typically vague and hurried. He never seemed to want to talk about that time, only briefly mentioning that his sister had died during the war from an untreated bout of pneumonia. But as I was talk taking a seminar with a special focus on Korea, he agreed to speak in more detail about the period. My father's family was originally from Pyongyang, now the capital of North Korea, and they had joined the throngs of refugees who were heading southward in the attempt to get behind the American lines. He recounted again that his sister had died of pneumonia during the refugee march, then added that rather casually that in fact his younger brother had died during their travels too. This last disclosure surprised me. I knew that he had lost a brother, this from asking him, as children often will, about how many siblings he had, matching the number against my uncles and aunts. But I remembered his saying that his brother had died in a subway accident. As I didn't think there was a subway in either Pyongyang or Seoul during his childhood, I asked him when his brother had died and how. My father cleared his throat, as is his habit when he's unsettled or nervous. And suddenly I wasn't sure at that moment if I was doing the right thing, asking this of him. But then he told me what happened, how his brother had been killed not by a subway car, but a boxcar of a train full of refugees. They were among the hundreds riding the cars. The car holding the rest of their family was packed tight, and so he and his brother, along with many others, had to sleep on top of the boxcar, exposed to the elements. In the middle of the night, the train halted violently, and his brother, who was eight years old at the time, fell off, the train then lurching forward for a distance. My father jumped down and went back and found his brother, whose leg had been amputated at the knee by the wheels of the train. My father carried his brother back to the car, to the rest of their family, as the blood and his life ran out of him. The first chapter of The Surrendered ends with this action, though I lend it to a character named June, who is nothing at all like my father in temperament or outlook. And while I did want to honor my father and memorialize his experience, I cannot say that this was the primary reason for writing the novel. Nor can I say, in truth, that it was to make forceful moral or political statements about the consequences of war, though naturally I hope the novel does suggest a few. I wrote the book for the reason I think most novelists write a book, which is to engage an aesthetic idea, to give oneself over to an unnameable creative impulse or urge that seems to be the question and answer and process all in one. It's an urge to create the thing I could not help but feel an intense curiosity about, an urge to write the book, in fact, that I wanted to read. For every writer, I believe, is a reader, first and last, and in this way is no different than anyone else in this room. For if you are sitting here tonight, it is because you value and support this most human of activities, because you know and believe in what reading can do, because you know that it opens you up in unlikely ways, that it makes you feel both powerful and utterly vulnerable, that it gives you heady infusions of wisdom and folly and heartbreak, that it can rend you into pieces that can never be put back the same way again. This is a transformation that is not necessarily easy or pleasant, but it is always illuminating. And we know it's this illumination that can lead us to greater understanding and empathy for the other, and perhaps indeed, love and peace. In this spirit, I'd like to suggest tonight that this celebration is in essence one that upholds not just writing, but good reading, and especially good readers like yourselves. Thank you very much.